Hello everyone, my name is Spencer Walsh, welcome to today's show, we got a good one for you as always on the show today, big news, big news from all corners of the political world today, a government shutdown is imminent, which I believe will be coming, yes, Saturday at midnight after the House failed to pass the Republican spending bill after a pretty sizable chunk of Republicans decided to rebel on Kevin McCarthy's deal and not vote for it. Again, that's going to send the government into shutdown. Um, it's going to be a pretty big deal there. And also today we have Diane Feinstein. She has passed away today at the age of 90. We're going to look back at her political career. We're going to look back at especially the last few years of her political career and really how we are definitely going to yeah, take a look at that especially uh, and some of the other egos that kind of got in the way there for sure. Also, the UAW strike just got even bigger. More workers are walking off the job. 7,000 more UAW members walking off the job, expanding the strike to two more plans. And we'll give a quick update on that, but really get into some of the Republican response to the strike and really maybe how sincere it really is from somebody like Josh Hall Hall. Lee. I was going to say hallway for some reason. It was on the picket line earlier this week. We'll give you some interesting information about that later in the show. So stay tuned for all that. we got a good one for you. This is Newsflash. All right. So we have the House moving into a government shutdown here. Uh, and really the government moving into a, a position of shutting down. Um, we have the uh, Kevin McCarthy has been working throughout the week, throughout the past two weeks, to try and essentially get a bill passed the House that is at least somewhat acceptable to the hard right members of the, you know, really, really the, the hard right members of his caucus, the hard right members like Matt Gates, like uh, I think like Victoria Miller, like. Uh, all these Freedom Caucus people who are essentially saying it, that Kevin McCarthy's budget does not cut enough from various programs and you know gives money to Ukraine doesn't you know pretty much any hard right thing that you can think of like these are people who are actively trying to you know they're they're probably celebrating the fact the government is shut down because of the fact that you know they view no government as being better uh, than you know a properly funded government with, you know, even the priorities that they want. They're just like, why not just give it any money? Let's just, you know, they, they are, they are radical, I think, in a way that very few Americans would comprehend, because this is not something I think that is in any way popular. It's, you know, standing up for this stuff, you know, making such a fight along these lines, I think it's just something that is clearly, clearly a political loser, you know, without a doubt. Um, so hardline conservatives, on Friday, tank Speaker Kevin McCarthy's long shot bid to pass legislation to avert a government shutdown, an extraordinary display of defiance that then made it clear uh, Congress would almost certainly miss a midnight deadline on Sunday, Saturday excuse me, to keep federal funding flowing. It appeared evident even before the vote the stop gap bill was bound to fail as several hard right Republicans had declared that they would not back a temporary spending bill known as a continuing resolution under any circumstances. And the measure, which would slash spending and impose severe immigration restrictions, never had a chance of preventing a shutdown since it was regarded as a non-starter in the Democratic controlled Senate. You, know, you still would have to go to negotiations like even if this was to pass, you know, it still would have meant a government shutdown because you know, there wouldn't have no time to iron things out in the Senate. So he's going to be bracing for a political blowback from for a government uh, closure, had scheduled it anyway, in hopes of showing he was trying to avoid the crisis and the decision by right-wing lawmaker to effectively blow up his one final effort to seize some political leverage and the shutdown fight dealt the Speaker a stinging defeat while leaving the politically vulnerable Republicans. Uh, you know, I'm sure all the ones, you know, for example, in New York, you've know, got Nancy Mason, uh, South Carolina, you know, all these moderate Republicans, they have got to be pissed because, you know, Kevin McCarthy is not going to have the power to stop these, um, you know, rebel Republicans from controlling the narrative. You know, they're going to be, especially with the base, they're going to be able to control the narrative. And to the average person, you know, they're going to be able to say that, you know, they're standing up to Kevin McCarthy, who is a Republican in name only, who is not, you know, literally executing every single IRS agent he can get his hands on, you know, that kind of thing, like, He's going to get incoming on one side from that, 
And then on the other side, it's going to be normal people who are like, why is the government getting shut down again? You know, like that is going to be the, the probably the most impactful uh, thing. But in terms of an insular political basis, especially with Kevin McCarthy's ability to survive long term as Speaker of the House and not see, receive some sort of challenge, um, I think it could be very, very interesting. So the decision by the right wing lawmakers to effectively blow up his one final effort is going to leave some Republicans fuming. Let's see what else there is. The defeat in the House sent Republicans back to the drawing board. A little more than 24 hours remaining before the shutdown deadline. Uh, he Apparently, he has other ideas about how to keep the government flowing, uh, which should be interesting. Republican leadership is meet, uh, meeting to discuss their next steps, and leadership alerted lawmakers that more votes will be expected on Saturday. The size of the group of defectors was striking, reflecting both McCarthy's weak hold on his conference the influence of the far right in the House. Because, you know, this is going to be a big deal. Because this is something that he absolutely cannot do, which is he cannot put a hold on these people. He's not going to be able to come in to, you know, Matt Gates to anyone else. Because, yeah, it's not just Matt Gates; It's like 12, 13 other people, which is a big chunk of people in political terms when you have margins that small. And they're not all going to, you know, they don't, don't have that media branding as crazy. You know, they're going to come off as good, respected conservatives. And even the people who do have the media branding is crazy in the mainstream media are very, very popular in conservative media. So it, he he essentially has no leverage and it's kind of just being led around by the tail um, in this situation. And I just, well, again, what I keep coming back to is where, where and when and how are the Democrats going to be coming in and seizing leverage? To absolutely you know, just get out of this of this situation, so um, you know they control the Senate, they control the presidency. You know why not have Chuck Schumer? Why not have Hakeem Jeffries try and do some sort of deal to you know seize the wind out from Kevin McCarthy? Why does he get to put his bill up in you know up in the air first? I just don't see any reason for you know why that should be. Um, but yeah, the loss was, it, it it made clear that he faces almost impossible odds of getting a stopgap funding bill. Uh, with votes from his party alone. And the simplest way to avert a shutdown would be for him to work with Democrats on a compromise measure. So uh, these are people who, are, you know, again, he has to cut them out of the political process, but, uh, you know, these hard-right Republicans. But if he does, he's going to lose his job because in order to be Speaker, he had to, you know, essentially agree to provision that one person issuing a letter of no confidence could do a leadership election. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be... You know, he's he's killed one way uh, via hanging and shot the other way out out back uh, if he does want, you know, he's, he's damned if he does damned if he doesn't in the extreme McCarthy is. Um, the Republican plan that was blocked on Friday would have kept the government open for 30 days, but it was opposed by Democrats because it would have cut spending to most domestic programs by nearly 30 percent to not include any military or humanitarian aid for Ukraine. Uh, and it would direct, by the way, there's pretty much no functional difference, I, you know, when push comes to shove on that, but that's a whole other conversation. And it would direct the Homeland Security Secretary to resume all activities related to the construction of the border wall at the southern border that were in place under former President Donald J. Trump. Uh, so Biden condemned the blow up as White House, uh, the White House dispatched his top budget official to brief reporters about the economic and national security risks of a shutdown. Um if the House fails to fill its most basic function, it fails to fund the government by tomorrow, it will have failed our troops. And, and again, Chuck Schumer, you know, he's not going to be able to really lead the way here because obviously, you know, Constitution says, <laughs> Constitution says all um, uh, financial bills have to come out of the House. But it is going to be a, you know, no, I don't see any reason why Hakeem Jeffries is not trying to pull off and make some sort of, some sort of framework and Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer are not leading the way and preparing the ground for the Senate to not lead some, you know, all they need to pull off is five Republicans. You could probably name them on the tip of your, you know, on, on your finger, you know, George Santos probably would flip, you know, Mike Lawler in New York, um, you know, Nancy Mace in South Carolina. Like these are all like we can go through. I could probably pull out five that would be doable or possibly, possibly flippable, um, if if push came push came to shove on this, um, let's see. We can yeah. You can go through here. Those are three of them that I named. Um, Anthony Desposito, like all these people in you know New York, for example, is a big area where there's so many Biden flipped districts. 
uh, some some people you know around the Florida area or around the Miami area who are you know just newly elected. Uh, all these people in these kind of you know blue state these Biden districts that are very very much, um, you know they're very very much on the on the edge when it comes to this, and and when it comes to really holding their seats, and they're going to need all the help and all the support that they can get to not look like they're causing chaos and trying to get the garbage and all, and all that stuff, uh, which does not seem to be working thus far. Um, yeah, you know, quite quite notably so. So um, he said, our service members will keep upholding their oath, showing up for work and standing sentinel around the world, keeping our country secure. They won't get paid. It's a disgrace. Um, federal agencies on Friday plan to send home hundreds of thousands of workers who would not get paid until the shutdown ended. The nation's capital always feels the effects of the shutdown most acutely. But Americans beyond Washington also face consequences as well. You're talking about FEMA. You're talking about national parks. Talking about social security, all that stuff that would be, you know, continue to be provided. Um, recipients of other programs, though, including uh, providing food assistance to women and young children, uh, would see a more immediate reduction of benefits. So that's, you know, all big and important things. Uh, Representative Dusty Johnson, Republican of South Dakota, near, uh, said of the 21 Republicans who opposed the stopgap, they will hear a lot of members that their opposition to the bill uh, that cuts spending and secures the border is going to make it harder for any of us to view them as partners in the future. You can see that at least some of this group are never going to go for a spending pitch. Uh, for a spending patch, underscoring how impossible it appears to be for House Republicans to pass even a party line measure at this point. So again, Hakeem Jeffries, please get in there. Like I don't know what stop it. Is there some procedural rule? Like I feel like it is. You know, maybe I'm missing something. But either way, uh, would be very very important to see. You know, some sort of effort to an interesting to see some sort of effort to peel off these moderate Democrats and put some or, or the moderate Republicans to put something forward uh, because it is certainly possible. All right. Big news today as well. Uh, Diane Feinstein, her historic career has come to an end. And boy, did she live it out all the way to the end. Uh, bye bye, die, as we say. She was the oldest serving senator and the longest serving woman in the U.S. Senate at the time of her death on Friday. At 90, she was a tenacious trailblazer and stalwart centrist with a sweeping political career that arced across immense transformation in Washington, D.C. But, uh, her home state of California as well. A little bit weird writing there from The Guardian, a little illustrious, um, which is pretty, it's kind of interesting the way it started. Uh, it was a hard one career that almost never was. In the late 70s, before she was senator, uh, her, she, and before she became San Francisco's mayor, Feinstein's political ambitions had stagnated. But after serving nine years on the board of supervisors, she lost two bids from mayors. Her moderate agenda and conservative, uh, kind of just, you know, she, I think she defended the Confederate flag in San Francisco or, you know, hanging it up on the, uh, California State House. Uh, it was, it was a pretty interesting one. She, like, kept the dress codes after she got elected in, in, in the Watergate years where it's, you know, supposed to be, a, you know, a moment for fe feminism. She was like, the women have to wear knee-length skirts and beyond. Um, you know, she was, you know, she trailblazed in some ways, but, you know, definitely kept some continuity in others. Um, so, so Richard Bradley, this is someone in San Francisco who took the Confederate flag down. He climbed up in the San Francisco State House. Uh, this is after she became mayor. Took the Confederate flag down. Why in the for, why in the hell was the Confederate flag flying in City Hall? Um, you know, which is incredible, which is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, Diane Feinstein Elementary. <laughs> this is when they had a name change in January 29, twenty twenty one. Um, you know, so it was when the eighteen flags in front of City Hall used to symbolize the different stages of American history. After Bradley took the flag down, Mayor Diane Feinstein ordered the Confederate flag be flown again. Uh, but she eventually changed her mind. Uh, that's, you know, that's uh, one other one. Um, it is, you know, it's quite a interesting thing to consider. She's always a curmudgeonly centrist, you know, supporter, supported by all the big interests, someone who's really a truly kind of senator from California. But the thing about her was on 27th of November 1978, in the late morning, gunshots rang through San Francisco City Hall. A conservative former supervisor had assassinated San Francisco's mayor, George Moscone, and supervisor Harvey Milk, one of the first openly gay elected officials in U.S. history. Feinstein rushed to help Milk, she told the L.A. Times, and when she tried to check his pulse, her fingers slipped through a bullet hole in his wrist. Wow. 
Uh, not long after, it fell to her to face the TV cameras, bloodstained, to announce that the two men had died. Really kind of incredible video that's going around online at the moment. Uh, liberals and leftists rallied behind her, electing her to finish Roscoe's term. She spoke of how the city had recovered from the 1906 earthquake. So, too, can we rebuild from this spiritual damage? Um, yeah, so she also in, was someone who investigated the torture report. Uh, which is one of the better things that she had done and passed the 1994 assault weapons ban. Uh, so as you as you can imagine, she's pretty tough on guns. She was, you know, California senator, but was one of the few people in national politics to come out and say, ban them all, turn them in, get them out. Um, yeah, so she spoke, um, she was kind of an anti-Anita Hill, uh, but she, I think she, no, it was, was it Lindsey Graham who gave Amy Coney Barrett a hug? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, so this is this is this was it. This was what I'm thinking of. Um, so she spoke about how in 1991, watching an all male committee interrogate Anita Hill um, uh, about allegations that Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas had sexually harassed her, had enraged and transformed her. Though uh, decades later, you know, she'd probably deteriorate a little bit. But uh, she critics said she fumbled the handling of the allegations against another nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, precipitating the outing of the woman who had accused him of sexual assault. Then with that Christine Blasey Ford letter, if you remember from back then, um, at the end of confirmation hearing of the ultra conservative Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who had helped since help dismantle abortion rights for U.S. women, Feinstein embraced Barrett and praised the Judiciary Committee Chair, Lindsey Graham, a moment that shocked her colleagues. She stepped down from her top position on the Judiciary Committee not long after, under pressure from liberal colleagues and constituents. Uh, so, wow. It was quite quite an interesting situation there when you look at her career. But I think another very important thing to kind of take a look at is the last period of her career. Because, I mean, if we look at it for real here, like, this is somebody who has been... You know, she it, it, it became, I'd say, probably pretty clear around like the start of the Trump administration, 2016, that she should not run for reelection in 2018. I mean, like people really got the sense like this is somebody who is not going to be kind of mentally there. I mean, she was someone who was forgetting, you know, a lot of things. I think the first like reports started to come out, you know, pretty early on. You know, th- this was also around the time when there's a lot of. Um, you know, pretty early on in the Trump administration, but there, this is around the, well, the time there was a lot of kind of uh, progressive energy. So the, those two things kind of you know really made the situation where she was running for reelection in twenty eighteen for her what I don't know fifth term or sixth term I think it was um, in the Senate, and she literally you know was not endorsed by the California Democratic Party like in in the primary process the California Democratic Party endorsed the challenger to Diane Feinstein who was you know to the left of her uh and also somebody who was not you know suffering from you know whatever long term condition you know obviously not confirmed yet but you know it was probably nothing very good but uh, you know whatever long term condition she was suffering for you know dementia you know you can you can write in whatever you know debilitating you know disease that old people have you know in the in the blank but that was so bad plus the fact that she was just so you know right wing in terms of the you know democratic party spectrum uh literally yeah the california establishment democratic party turning against the senator of 30 years and saying no we want this other guy but you know who came in at the last last minute to uh, push him across the line, push Feinstein across the line, and say, "Oh no, you got to support Feinstein. She's someone who's been around the block for a long time. She's capable. She can do it." It was Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and some of the top leaders of the Democratic Party in Washington D.C. Like they were the. I think Barack Obama made his first endorsement of the 2018 cycle, probably the most important cycle for Democrats in the midterms in a very long time because of you know the post-Trump cycle energy was so high. You know they did so well. Barack Obama, the leader of the Democratic Party's first endorsement. At, in, in of the cycle was of Diane Feinstein, and that was specifically to ensure she had another term and to keep things going on for her. Because, I mean, I don't know, just the power, it was the ego, you know, all the stuff continues to go around. So she gets elected in 2018. That's when the stories really start to pick up about her just, you know, not being well, her not being, you know, you know, physically there, you know, not knowing where she is, forgetting to do certain things, you know, staff doing most of the things, uh, you know, in the office for her and her just really being able to not complete a lot of her senatorial duties. 
and you know it really kind of builds up to, into you know 2018 throughout you know really last year this year i would say was this new level of kind of building period uh you know where we had a story probably about every i don't know 18 months talking about how Diane Feinstein is just not well. Like, there was some real problems with Diane Feinstein. And, you know, people started to realize, hey, who are the people that are keeping this whole situation? Oh, right. It's her staff. You know, like, these are the people who are in the senatorial office, the senior senator from California's office, the biggest state population-wise in the country, so much political power. You know, what is their incentive? What is their benefit structure here? It's for, you know, for them to keep their jobs, for them to keep putting this person in place, and for them to essentially have – control over a senatorial position because you know Diane Feinstein you know the last three four years was not making you know essentially any decisions and this is somebody who you know she's done I think it's kind of sad in a certain way you know when you maybe when you consider you know the person and the career and you know what she actually did maybe not as sad but you know it is kind of sad that these people who are so blatantly careerist who are so just ambitiously trying to keep themselves you know, employed, keep themselves in the, on the inside, you know, in, on Capitol Hill working with somebody and also probably enjoying the outside power of just having a boss who is literally mentally not all there, um, you know, in, in an incredibly powerful position. Like they let her live out the last, you know, four or five years of her life in probably just really uncomfortable, unhappy, kind of just oddly terrified all the time you know it's just like not knowing where i am like where like why am i here what am i doing like you know it, it must have not been a last a fun last few years for her and i think that is something that those people will definitely have to live with for a lot long period of time and it's, it's honestly quite sad because it you know she could have been you know having si- sipping a nice margarita on the porch or whatever but you know there she is making votes she, like she voted the day before she died at 11.45 a.m. the previous day, she voted on some – she, quote-unquote, voted, I should say. Uh, you know, no, it was her staff just pressing a button, obviously. But, like, it really is remarkable. And then you get this whole situation where she is going through this shingles nonsense in 2023. We talked about this on the show. Judiciary nominees are not being appointed um, – and they're trying to pressure her to resign for, for health reasons. But Nancy Pelosi now is coming in. And from, from all accounts, Nancy Pelosi's daughter, Alexandra, lived at their house. You know, they got Feinstein to give up power of attorney to Feinstein's daughter. And apparently the reason was Pelosi was putting so much pressure on her fellow San Franciscan uh, Feinstein was to stop Barbara Lee from getting in there as the kind of... Um, you know, the supplementary appointment, like the the replacement appointment, because, of course, Gavin Newsom had promised to put in a black woman and he wa- she wanted Adam Schiff, you know, a fellow, you know, awful corporatist, you know, intelligence industry, you know, plant and also, you know, another fellow San Franciscan. I don't really know how much that matters, but like that was the reason that she kept, you know, <laughs> ruining the twilight years of this woman's life so that, you know, Barbara Lee would not be able to get in there and, you know, that. That probably was what accelerated her her process, uh, you know, by quite a long period of time. All right. Yeah, really, really crazy story with Diane Feinstein. It'd be very interesting to see who Gavin Newsom puts in as a replacement. They're probably going to be bar- – uh, probably not going to be Barbara Lee just, you know, because I don't think Gavin Newsom is, is like that personally. You know, he's not going to do the, you know, the good thing. He's going to do something that is, you know, fundamentally in line with the corporatist agenda. But we will see. We'll keep an eye on it. Uh, with that being said, we'll go to our next story in just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and supporting Newsflash. We now have a brand new way for you to be heard if you want, whether a text message or a audio message. Please, no video messages. I really just do not think that's necessary. We have a new feedback box open for you Ladies and gentlemen, it is officially open, swrn702 at gmail.com. Send a text message, send a voice message um, of no more than 30 seconds via the voice memos function. Either of those two options, and we will 100%, 100%, not going to find this guarantee anywhere else. 
We're going to play it on the show. Listen to what you have to say. And it literally could be about anything. Well, if it's inappropriate, we won't play it. But it could be about anything. Thank you so much. This is my thank you to all the listeners who have stuck out with us and want to have their own voice in the show. SWRN702 at gmail.com is the address. All right, just want to say, though, as uh, SWN 702 is that address. We had in a really interesting question come in on that email address lately, and we're obviously going to continue to moderate and read that stuff back, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, here here it is. Biden, and this is about Biden, the stuff we covered on the last show, and we're about to cover really here now. Um, it's what about the contradiction Biden faces with his consistent messaging of electric cars his you know, uh, pushing of the electric car infrastructure. What is his strategy for future uh, for the future of the people he picketed with is his hope for the future. If his hope for the future is electric cars, will they end up not voting for him? Um, you know, because, yeah, that is an interesting point, because it's certainly right. What Donald Trump hopes is going to happen. Like they they really hope that um you know he's he comes he he keeps coming in and saying the union leaders they want to switch to electric cars this is not going to go well for you you know this is going to be a bad situation and it really you know if there was a you know a Hillary Clinton style democrat or you know Hillary herself at the helm you know it probably would have been a much more convincing case because you know it, i think Hillary was someone who was definitely less committed to the idea of, you know, a big things when it comes to EVs and also especially was less committed to supporting organized labor than Joe Biden was. You know, I, it's kind of hard to imagine given her kind of corporate history and her like, ties to the banks, you know, showing up to the UAW picket line and things like that. Um, but this is going to be kind of going to what I talk about, uh, talked about on the last show about Biden being able to use his political power to actually support workers and support his agenda at the same time. You know, Biden, he did make a move to do some pretty, you know, not really, I wouldn't say super transformative, but, you know, really significant uh, steps towards building EV infrastructure. Uh, but he, you know, has to. I would say it is it is kind of unclear what the strategy is for the future of the people that he picketed with. You know, he could, you know, I think the strategy is to, you know, really ensure that those UAW fact or, you know, that those electric vehicle factories uh, are union made and that they have access, you know, to those plants, which seems to be something that Biden supports. But, uh, you know, it's the, the question is, can he act on it? You know, if he follows that strategy is one thing. Can he act on it is another thing. Um, and that will be, you know, the big thing to keep an eye on here as as we go um, down the road. And in terms of, you know, I really don't think union members have a specific aversion to electric cars um, and, and making electric cars. You know, if Trump is able to convince them that they're going to be unprofitable, they're going to lose to, lead to economic precarity and instability. You know, then that's going to be a big problem. But if Biden continues to be as he is, you know, a vocal uh, you know, advocate for union rights and someone who is there, supportive and communicative with union workers in the way the Democratic Party has not been for a very long time. I think, he, you know, that will be a kind of politically neutralized issue. So essentially, bottom line is, as long as people are, you know, making money and making cars, I don't think they really care too much about what cars they'll make. But it's incumbent on Biden to make sure that they are in a position to do that and that those EV factories are union shops. Otherwise, you know, that Trump could really seize the narrative and say, look at all these union leaders going electric. They're not supporting supporting you and could make, you know, quite a bit of hay about that. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Keep them coming, SWRN702 at gmail.com. Uh, but we still have some more strike news to talk about today. Uh, 7,000 UAW workers are at two more assembly plants, have walked off the job at noon Eastern today as UAW President Sean Fain announced in a Facebook Live appearance this morning. Joining the strike are Ford Chicago Assembly Plant and General Motors Lansing Delta Township Assembly in Michigan. Fain announced that Stellantis would be spared at this time. The union had ex been expected to strike all three companies, but Region 1 Director LaShawn English, uh, three minutes before the live stream said, um, the UAW received frantic emails from company representatives. According to Fain, Salantis has made significant progress on cost of living allowances, the right not to cross a picket line, and the right to strike over product commitments and plant closures. We are excited about this momentum at Salantis and hope, hope, uh, hopes it continues. 
so Fain said he made clear that negotiations with all three companies are ongoing. I'm still very hopeful that we can reach a deal that reflects the incredible sacrifices and contributions our members have made over the last decade. He said to 60,000 viewers on Facebook, which kind of was smart on many levels. You know, for all the reasons we talked about before, he's keeping the, you know, keeping you know the uaw or the the big three guessing he's you know really changing things up he's also making a media event out of this every week you know what strikes are going to be added it's keeping people engaged it's people people communicative hopeful and also keeping that strike fund lasting for quite a long time he says but i know that we win at the bargaining table what we win at the bargaining table depends on the power we build on the job it's time to use that power uh, so pretty exciting stuff there to take a look at uh, when it comes to, you know, Sean Fain really advocating for um, the rights of auto workers in a pretty new and pretty innovative way in, I think it must be said. Um, I think he said, he says, but I, I, I also know that we went at the bargaining table. It's time to use that power um, and the strategic use of that power. With again keeping that interest high, keeping people guessing, people you know, are we going to strike? Is it going to be us this time? Are they going to call us to stand up and and, and walk out? Um, you know, that is something that you know. For example, it says here in the Jackman article, UAW local five five one member Marcelina Pedraza said her coworkers at the Chicago assembly plant were anxiously awaiting the news of the next targets because you know they were hoping uh, maybe it could be them. Are we going to be called? Is it? Are we going to get a tentative agreement? Like it's it's a very exciting and kind of. Uh, you know, engaging situation that shows a you know unions can play a role in your life, and if you stick by them, they can actually win some real advancement, some real good positive changes for their members. Uh, and that is, you know, that is I think what is being shown here pretty pretty clearly. Um, yeah. So with that being said, let's take a look at another kind of visitor of the picket line this week. We talked about Joe Biden, but this is in The Intercept here. When Senator Josh Hawley, Republican of Missouri, appeared at a GM plant in Wentzville, Missouri, earlier this week to join members of the United Auto Workers on the picket line um, against the big three automakers. There he called himself pro-worker, challenged the companies to give a workers a pay raise uh, and more time off, and said he's with the workers 100%. While he's rallying against the big three now, he's previously received campaign contributions from automakers. Um, during the first run for the Senate, his first run for the Senate in 2018 and through 2020, Holly's PAC has received $8,500 from GM's PAC, according to records filed with the Federal Election Commission. So they're, they're essentially, you know, filling Holly's campaign coffers here. His Senate campaign received uh, $3,500. From Ford's PAC and another 1000 from a GM executive during that same time period. His PAC and his campaign received an additional $13,000 from PACs associated with Toyota, a Japanese company notorious for running non-union shops in the U.S. Um, apparently, he says that as of 2021, he, has no, he is no longer going to be accepting money uh, from corporate PACs. So it's going to be an interesting thing to watch. You know, is his transformation here real? And I think more broadly is, you know, the question that I think, mean, you know, people on the left should be asking and examining, uh, you know, and keeping a very close eye on down the road. Is the right for real on their pro-union bona fides? And I think it's very, very tempting for a lot of people to say no. And I think, you know, by and large, that does seem to be the right answer. Like, you know, there it does seem like there are going to be, um, you know, more more likely than not, when push comes to shove, that the Republicans are going to support the automakers. You know, we saw on the debate stage, you saw Trump, you know, he didn't support any of the workers' demands. He just, you know, said some stuff about you know, electric car, how electric cars are bad, and, you know, really stopped short of full-throated supporting the union, supporting, um, you know, their fight against, you know, the big, you know, corporations. And I think Hawley was definitely the most explicit about it, but he seems right now uh, so far to be alone. Which, I mean, you know, obviously things like this are subject to change. These political movements like the burgeoning of it and, you know, how clear and how viable it seems. All of that very, very much subject to change. But I think it is very interesting to to see, you know, and I, I think the, the way it's kind of looking at now is the fact that Hawley, you know, maybe Marco Rubio has kind of made some noise around this. But, you know, he also has a long history of close corporate ties, you know, pre 2016 2020 when everyone started to try, you know try to be populist and create the quote unquote new right but um you know i think it's very telling that holly was the only republican out there you know i'll say that because it shows you that 
you can always have him out there, you know, to point to these people, say, we're with you 100%. How do you do, fellow union workers? You know, you guys are looking real good. Is the strike fund going to hold up pretty well? You know, like, we're rooting for you. We're behind you. You know, all that, you know, kind of uh, you know, that whole, you know, uh, show, I guess, you know, that presentation of being a working class blue collar Republican who supported of union workers, but he's the only one. They're not hearing it from a national level. You know, th- this is a sign. You know, they're the main messaging out of every Republican media outlet in Oregon. Uh, even though unions are popular with Republicans um, or Republican voters, is that unions suck and the people striking, you know, at least Tim Scott saying on the debate stage, deserve to be fired. And the, the messaging from what I've heard on you know, conservative media is not talking about it or just kind of parroting much of the same of the, you know, the Tim Scott, the classic Republican anti-union right to work line. Um, so I think as long as that remains the case, there's going to be a big pool of voters who are getting more and more friendly to unions. And as long as it continues to get politicized and kind of drawn towards the right, you know, the right part of uh, or kind of the more left wing associated and Biden continues to cozy up to unions and maybe unions continue to, you know, really cozy up to Biden in a more public manner instead of just kind of really endorsing him. You know, he tends to interact with them more. It could have, you know, some interesting consequences and maybe pulling workers more towards the unions and towards the working class side of things towards back towards the Democrats, which is something they could definitely benefit from. So, with that being said, only time will tell, and we will continue to tell you what the news is next Monday on News Flash.